are we living in the matrix? Is the universe just one big simulation? What if everything we thought we knew was nothing more than virtual reality? Ponder the answers to these questions and more on Glitch in the Matrix with me, Doug Rizzio, and our first guest, glitch artist and musician, Paul Bodwin. Hey, Hi, Doug. Doug. How are you? How's it going? Welcome to Simultaneous Time. What time is it for you over there? Uh, at the moment, it's about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, oh, wow. But it's, go it's now time. <laughs> The time it's is the now. Time when, when we are both together, same place, same dimension, but and we're ready to go. Awesome. All right, so let's just get this uh, show on the road. Paul, who are you as an artist? Oh, you know that should be kind of a simple question. Uh, it's it's one, it's complicated. <laughs> one of the things that you know. I think I can talk about, I was professionally trained as a composer. So I began many, many years ago in music, but I've always had a serious interest in painting, in theater, and in video. Uh, but through the course of academic training, uh, social factors, things kind of get shaped in a certain way. And I would say probably for almost three decades, I was a professional composer and a professional instructor of uh, instructor of art history. Oh, that's interesting. So that's how I sort of made my living. And then about 10 years ago, I made my first trip to Estonia, uh, essentially to give a talk on using uh, virtual media in the classroom to teach. And something happened to me here in Estonia, and I had a kind of inner rumbling. And it turned out that this inner rumbling was about changing how I expressed myself. And what eventually emerged was Paul, who does not only music, but does painting, does text, does video. Uh, so I really become kind of an interdisciplinary artist. So I think one of the things that that makes me kind of interesting is that I've been open to the idea of changing the way I use art to express myself. Um, that may be the most unclear answer of all. No, um, that gives me so much to so much to work with and so many more questions. So you started out as a musician and then gravitated towards art history. So that that must give you a must a much broader perspective um, than just being rooted in technology alone. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's interesting that for me, uh, because of my age, technology actually came kind of late in my life. And I was an advocate of using technology to teach in the classroom because I taught music in a place where music wasn't easily accessible, uh, I relished the idea of, at the time, things like YouTube and Spotify and iTunes. It brought another world to my students that they could experience. And what I realized was the technology that I was using to teach could also be the technology I used to create art. Mm. And so there was a kind of gentle morphing between a, a kind of professional world, the world where I sort of made money, and this other world of creative expression. Uh, and, and they kind of just kind of blurred the boundaries. And, and, and I'm now at the place where the boundaries have flipped. So education is kind of receding, and my ability to express myself artistically is just exploding. So I'm, I'm curious about the fact that um... You're a little older than I am, um, but it sounds like you took to these technologies pr pretty pretty early in their infancy. Yeah, I was around. <laughs> <laughs> of course, when I talk to my, my teachers, of course, they talk about computers the size of, you know, office buildings and, and cooling systems and running <laughs> IBM punch cards. 
So sure. I, I, I realize now that the power I have in my cell phone is is more power than what they probably had, what NASA had to, to land Neil Armstrong on the moon. Oh, and yeah, I think that's you, constantly that is, quoted. That is if you believe Armstrong went on the moon. My, my well, that's just... that didn't happen, but... <laughs> Oh, that really? Well, that's yeah. somewhat related to, I guess, this this subject matter, but maybe a question for another time. Indeed. Um. So we talked about yourself as an artist. Now, can you talk a bit more about how exactly did that transition happen from where you were doing um, music, studying art history, and teaching? What was what was the first moment that really catapulted you into where you are right now as a glitch artist, as a as someone who's interdisciplinary? You know, I'm not sure it's any one event that makes a, a massive transport uh, transformation. I think it's a series of small moves. Uh, you know, it's sort of like taking baby steps. And then you realize after three years or five years, these baby steps have actually brought you to a completely other place. But I will talk about a moment that I had literally just last year, last January, which I think was a real kind of watershed moment for me. Um, and, and it made me understand myself as an artist. One of the things that I think was important to me was that my art, uh, my music, I, I wrote it to impress other people, to impress my teachers, to impress my friends, to, to, to say, oh, wow, you're, you must be some kind of genius if you can write music. I was making art for all the wrong reasons. The second I started making art for myself, it was such a turnaround, Doug. I, I can't even tell you the, the possibilities and the opportunities that emerge from being honest with what you're really doing. Um, it has just been an incredible moment for me. And one that I look back over a 30 year career and I think, wow, in some ways I wasted so much time. On the other hand, my life has been amazing with the numbers of people that I've been able to to be with and to work with. I mean, John Cage was somebody that was a friend and, and I worked with him 15 years maybe. So, you know, these are people that, that just silently guided me and I just kept going. So I don't think there's ever a kind of moment where where you kind of break and say, aha, um, I think it's a series of those that, that bundle themselves as a kind of journey. Yeah, they say that the, uh, the largest or the longest journey begins with the first step. And it is Every hard to step. see, I guess it is hard to see where exactly uh, those steps are leading you until you look back at all of them behind you. It is always retrospectively. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a wonderful uh, Buddhist thought that all rivers are going to the sea. Mm. So so all of us from the moment we're born are headed towards the sea or our death. And, and the way we kind of get there is unique to each one of us. You know, I definitely want to ask you more about uh, your personal beliefs, because I, I know that informs a lot of your thoughts about this whole theme of living in the matrix. Um, but I want to ask you first, before we go in that direction, I mean, we've, we've talked a little bit about how you got to where you are. Where would you say you are now as an artist? What kind of projects are you working on? What you know, doing? every single day I am making art and I'm finding ways to promote that self as an artist. Uh, I, you know, it's funny. To, just today, I'm doing your show. I have a track on a new CD released from France. Wow. And a painting of mine is in an exhibition somewhere in the U.S. And that all happened today. Oh, my God. So that's it's, awesome. It's kind, of, it's kind of an auspicious day. Uh, and 
for this event, I'm actually going to premiere uh, a brand new uh, video piece, uh, which I hope will be quite inspiring. So I'm, I'm just working on becoming clearer at my ability to express kind of what I'm seeing in the world. I, I really believe that all artists reflect the times from which they live. Um, we write from our perception of today. And yes, I come burdened with this history of Bach and Beethoven and Mozart, but it's my job now to kind of tell the story of my generation. So I need skills for that. And the skills of my generation are, are heavy with technology. So I feel very blessed to be able to use these uh, skills to, to create art. Do you feel like you, it's, I mean, it sounds like that there are our whole generation during this time, everyone is more oriented towards technology than the generation before, no matter who you are, whether you're someone who barely uses it, someone who's using it every day, there's still, we still have such a relationship with technology uh, that even the most, even the biggest Luddite can't avoid it. And I, I'm wondering, do you feel like you gravitated towards technology because it's the tool of the time? Or do you feel like there's something innate to you that really felt that computers, glitch art, and things like that were geared towards your personal sensibilities? I, you used a very special word. Technology is a tool. It's... Technology is no better or worse than a paintbrush or a typewriter or a pen and paper. I mm. still will go to a pencil and paper to write down music. That kind of very slow process of mind to body action uh, gives a certain kind of result. But, you know, glitch is kind of, it is relatively new. Uh, it comes, very. I think, from the early 60s. Uh, I... Uh, an astronaut, Glenn, I should know his name, uh, said there was some kind of glitch in the in the program of this of this rocket, uh, and it, it it stuck. I think glitch is a certain aesthetic that is related to our time. So it is a way of expressing our our zeitgeist, if that makes any sense. So. Uh, Technology is just a tool, um, you know, and, and, and I think one of the simple misunderstandings about technology is people think that technology makes things easy. And by far, the amount of people now who are making art and making music and making poetry and making video, it has exploded. And we've seen platforms all over the globe hosting these forms of expression. But these platforms aren't uh, reliant on an aesthetic. Our appreciation of sort of understanding what is good and what is bad. So I, I think there's another layer that has to be put on this uh, tech cake, but it may be many, many years before that happens. Mm. You know, you I know, was... Just... What... No, keep Sorry, going. Go ahead. No, no, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, oftentimes people will will ask me, you know, like, well, what makes glitch art so great? And I'm like, well, actually, there's a lot of glitch art that's not so great. So, so the, the frames of reference, the frames of my aesthetic reference come actually from my training, come from my academic training as a painter and as a composer. And I think that is a, a very nice box of knowledge to walk around with. So, anyway. You know, you could say that uh, about a lot of art. And I think in one, in one interesting way, um, it's art has become more accessible than ever, be ever before. And for that reason, there's more art that's bad, that's visible than ever before. Because now everyone is empowered and, and emboldened to make it, even if by all accounts, it's not good at all. But there's there's something beautiful in that too. Absolutely, and I and I 
we might want to address that when we talk about sort of on the other side of, of this uh, of this performance. Sure. Because I think all artists make art because they they need to express themselves in a way that only art can. So mm. who am I? Who am I to say, oh, your piece is garbage? To them, and probably their mother, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> One would hope. <laughs> Let's hope. Uh, but the point is, is that a lot of that will get shuffled and sifted. Mm. And eventually, pieces will come to kind of define a, a style, a, a zeitgeist, a kind of sense of what it was like. Uh, and, and a lot of it will fall. When I look at Bandcamp, I'm overwhelmed. And I think to myself, and I want to contribute to that torrent, meaning this so much music. And I think, yes, because it's mine. It's because it's, I have something to say, and I say it this way. It might be very different from the way you say it or the way somebody else might say it. So it's like saying... I'm here. I exist. What I'm trying to say is important, if only to me. And I'm going to try to shout as loud as I can and be as articulate as I can so that my art doesn't kind of float to the bottom. Yeah, I think that's really the, the spirit of the entire generation. Um, you know, no longer are we, we're not confined to needing a publisher or needing to even be someone special or important, needing to know someone who is. We don't need to be um, royalty to have our legacy be passed down over time through history. Even if no one looks at it, it's still there. And there's something important about having the ability to maybe be seen or maybe be heard. Even though no one is actually listening, you, there's the opportunity to do that. And I think that is what, what everyone is gravitating towards. I, I think that, I think that more people in the next generations are going, going to be doing what we're doing. Everyone's going to make some form of art, even if they're, even if they never would have had the thought if they lived 10, 20, 30 years ago, because it's so available, people of all walks of life will have some creative endeavor you know, secondary or even as a tertiary project to the other things that they do in life, just because they can. And that's, that's amazing. I think it's a nice way to say I existed. <laughs> and so, um, do you want me to talk a little bit about what you're about to see? Um, let me, yeah, why don't we talk about what projects you want to work on in the future? Um, just for a few more I haven't. I, I sort of have an immediate future. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, I'm about to do a, a performance piece, uh, which will be centered on live glitch action. So I'm trying to figure out how to make a glitch of my physical body to project in the theater space uh, in a kind of uh, holographic way. And wow. this, gl this glitch of me will actually be the performer uh, in a piece talking about memory. I'm, I, I've been really kind of hooked up in memory lately and these ideas of memory. Um, I... I want to be able to uh, kind of integrate uh, a lot of my experiences in, and continue working with interdisciplinary subjects. Uh, my paintings now are beginning to include sound. Mm. Uh, my videos now are looking more like moving paintings. So there's this kind of blurring of boundaries that fascinates me. And what I often find very compelling is using a kind of text uh, to kind of help the viewer orient themselves in this new cosmos. 
So I'm, I'm looking to actually turn to more technology <laughs> uh, in order to express myself in a kind of maybe ephemeral way. Um, and again, this has to do with my thinking about this matrix, who I am in this skin. Uh, and, and, and what does it mean that I express myself? Where is this expression coming from? And why is it so important that I preserve it? Mm. And I'm also beginning to be very conscientious about the ways our technology is also ephemeral. You know, I remember the big floppy disks. They were about the size of a 45 record, and you could buy them. They were they were on flimsy plastic, and then those got into a small sort of three by five uh, disk. I mean, just in my lifetime, I, I've seen Walkman and iPods and boom boxes and iPhones. And it, it, the technology is changing so quick. And the formats of these aren't often backwards compatible. No, they're not. So if I'm an artist who's using technology, I have to be a little bit conscientious about the preservation of that. Mm. What happens when my music is electronically generated and the technology that made that sound disappears? It's not like a Beethoven symphony. No. And uh, memory is a big theme in your work right now. And uh, would you like to start sharing some of your... Um, well, we actually never, we never saw any of your, your work on the screen. But I guess because your work is so is so multimedia we can view the images of your work while we're listening to it too so i um yes you're about to see a, a, a kind of it, it's a movie <laughs> i suppose it's a performance piece uh done uh through video uh with sound. I'll just use it at that. Um, and maybe we can talk about that experience afterwards. Um, sure. But this is a piece that deals with um, the idea of memory, the memory of being a child, the memory of family, and perhaps the idea of surveillance. Mm. And, and how far back does surveillance really go? And so... Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, I, 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 it's called This. And um, I think what I should do is get it queued up and uh, let you sort of be in control of that. Sure. So let me, let me get that. So I will do this. It, and So I'm going to press go, and Doug, I'll let you be sort of in control of that. All right. Now, should I let it run for the yes. full length? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, I'm going to put add this to the stream and put us in the background. Your estimated wait time is... 15 minutes.
This box of crayons, this bracelet of charms, this broken chair, this button-down shirt, this cologne, this dream, this greeting card, this grocery list, this handwritten note, this home movie, this leftover party favor, this locket of hair, this lucky coin, this mixtape, this paperback book, this photograph, this pocket watch, this poem, this poster, this promise ring, this quilted blanket, this recipe book, this secret diary, this shoebox, this sweater, this tattoo, this yellowed ivory pipe. Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you. Oh. 
I want to, I'm torn because I want to, I want to hear more about it, but I also want to talk about living in the matrix with you. So I, you know what? I trust in your ability to seamlessly weave them together though. I, uh, that's a, that's a good bet. Probably Doug. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going to encourage you to go to Vegas, but that's pretty safe. (laughs) So yeah. Can you, can you tell me about what we just saw and heard? and how it relates to the larger theme that we're talking about for this show. It seems to me becoming more and more apparent that our lives are measured by data and that the kinds of data that we create will form a kind of information about us as a species. But one of the things that has also fascinated me is that this idea of data collection goes back far before our advent of computers. And I thought, what was the most popular form of data collection and when did it start? And really it kind of started with photography. Hmm. And then When I thought about the camera, especially in its sort of popular life between, say, the 50s and the 60s, especially in the U.S., the camera was the device that collected data about our family, about our trips, about our luxuries. In fact, having a camera, a film camera, this was a sort of status status symbol. And so I thought, how interesting would it be to kind of combine this old home movie with some kind of contemporary interface about how we collect data and what we do with data and how in a lot of ways our computer technology can skew this data or even create errors or artificial us um, you know the kind of deep fake as it were which can be incredibly believable uh, there was a science study not too long ago where they had two, two people, let's say, uh, delivering some information. And without fail, the deep fake version was almost always believed over a real life human being. And I found that fascinating. Wow. So we, our minds are collecting data from the instant we're born. And our data comes from our family, from our experiences. And so we, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this matrix thing, um, especially since I, I have recently come to having more reliance on Buddhism. It, and, and I keep thinking, what are the, there's sort of two sides that I could talk about this, but really, you know, Doug, there's nobody who knows you better than yourself. You're the only one who's had the experiences that you've had. You're the only ones that have the memory that you have. Anybody else that looks at you and knows you, knows you differently. And so that to me is a kind of simultaneous universe. Hmm. And yet in these last couple of days, as I look at what has been unfolding in the Ukraine, that is a reality that I have to contend with. So I have also been around significant others who have had severe psychotic breaks with reality. There's no doubt in my mind that what she saw was real. So, I so know, what? what <laughs> I don't know, man. I think is probably the best answer. <laughs> we don't even need a show. We can just say, I don't know, man. <laughs> well, you know, I, I I think about this. You know, so so much of us lately have been headed towards this kind of self help. This idea of uh, uh, now that we're in quarantine, maybe we can you know, meditate and kind of think about our true purpose and blah, 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 blah. And in our minds, 
we can truly create the reality of the life that we want. I wanted to let go of a career that was destroying me emotionally, physically, financially. And I wanted to embrace this career of creative expression. I had to create that here first. And once I created it here, it manifested out here. And that's, that is in a lot of different kinds of faiths. If, if it's a faith of Judaism, it's the face of Sufism, it's the face of Buddhism. If you can speak it, it can manifest. So do you think Whether that there is... No, keep yeah. going. No, no, it's all right. <laughs> I was going to ask you, do you think that there's a... Do you think that that mechanism for action or manifestation is envisioning something so that then you can take that um, into your own hands? Or do you think that there's something else underlying the system that we live in that enables that to happen, even without direct action from us? How do you think, what's the mechanism of action there? Is, is it the matrix making it work? You know, in business, they have this beautiful saying called the hidden hand. These are things that guide the marketplace or guide society unknowingly. I think that we have to deal with both. We have to deal with the external world, what we're seeing around us. And we have to kind of interface with that in a way that allows us to go in and out of that state. It, it, it's, um, you know, I, I, I looked at the last Matrix movie and I'm like, oh, come on. You go back to save the girl? Come on. Of course, right? There's, you know, that's Hollywood. <laughs> Same old. How about I go back to save myself? <laughs> mm. You know? Uh, and so really, I think moving forward, I think you have to learn how to save yourself. You have to be able, you, you in a kind of generic sense, have to develop those skills so that you can interface with the outside world, with these external factors in a way that doesn't damage you. Um, you know, great scene always, these bullets that are flying towards right towards us. This is everyday life. Bullets are coming at us. And we've got to find a way to slow them down. We've got to find a way to avert their danger to us. So, you know. Uh, so the matrix can be a great metaphor for, for things that we want to do in ordinary life. But I'm also curious to hear what your thoughts are about what it might be trying to say about um, something beyond the traditional experience of the world. Are we, for, are we in a computer simulation? Are we in a, in a form of virtual reality? Are we in the I won't. It's not a virtual reality. What I like to think of it is a constructed reality. Mm. For example, a uh, very simple example. You want to do this show at 7 o'clock your time. In order for me to participate in that, I have to adjust my sense of time to your sense of time. That's so true. Time, time is a completely artificial concept. There's, there's this is a man-made concept. Uh, borders are, 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 are land borders, are, are constructs. Our social interactions are constructs. Um, these are all things that help build us kind of an amicable society, mm. a society in which we can kind of live and function without great fear. But boy, isn't that a lie too. <laughs> so what you're saying is that we, we sort of live in a matrix of our own minds. It's a matrix we, of our construction. Yes. And, and in order for us to navigate it in a kind of healthy way, 
we have to accept this. Now, what happens if we don't accept it? We call them mentally ill. We call them outcasts. Oh, don't talk to her. She's psychotic. Don't, they're a sociopath. What are they saying is they are interfacing with our world in a way that doesn't conform with the rest mm. of us. And so let's push them away. Let's get rid of them because they're kind of dirtying up our room. Uh, we'd like to know seven o'clock, be there, you know. Um, and for a lot of people, that's not the way the world works. And it doesn't work a lot of that way for a lot of creative people. Um, you know, there's a, there's a kind of popular misconception that artists have to be kind of these suffering, deplorable beings. And this all comes from sort of Beethoven. This is absolutely not true. But I do think artists need to have a different sense of the world than do a lot of other people. So you mentioned earlier that uh, you knew someone who had some sort of experience or perspective that was a little different from what most other people have. And that relates to what we're talking about here now. Would you be able to talk more about that? Yes. In fact, there is an extraordinary glitch artist living in California. His name is Jared Brunei. And he suffers from psychosis. Um, and and his work reflects that. Do you ever have a bad dream? Of course. Do you ever wake up scared and your heart's pounding and maybe you're sweating? Why? Well, uh, something that I created in my own mind is effectively... And you believe it. I believe, yeah, I believe, I'm, it's, I'm creating a simulation in a, in a so, way. So don't we in some way every night enter a kind of matrix remix? Um, I happen to be a very lucid dreamer. Uh, I, I, I love my dream world in its blacks and whites and all colors. And sometimes it's very hard for me to come out of it and say, whoa, did that really just happen? And what if it did? There's a there's a great uh, uh, Buddhist story which I actually think uh, was made into a an early computer game. Um, really, it's a story about Zhang Zhu. He's a Buddhist monk, and he's in the garden and he's meditating, and he sees this butterfly in the garden, and before. Somehow he falls asleep, but in this sleep he he sees this butterfly flying around and drinking the nectar and being in the and then the butterfly comes up to the sleeping monk and the monk wakes up and the monk asks, "Am I a man dreaming of a butterfly, or am I now a butterfly dreaming I'm a man?" These kinds of things, make you think. So are you dreaming right now? What is this experience? This is a form of reality that I choose to participate in willingly. So I am making this in cooperation with you. Hmm. So, so this is this is this is a willed participation in our other states of mind. These aren't necessarily willed by us. These are under the control of our of our own mind, of our own consciousness. I mean, our consciousness is the only thing that tells us we are alive. Well, you could say the same thing about reality too, right? Because when you're in a dream, you often – you don't even realize you're in one. And you act as if the reality that you're living in is is real to you in that moment. And when you wake up, you might look back on the decisions you made 
in that dream and go, why would I do that? Why, why would that happen? Why would I even imagine something like that while I was dreaming? But while you're in there, you feel like everything that's happening, even if it's strange, is perfectly within the realm of possibility. And you're the one in control. You know that there's a positive flip side to this, which is that in that dream state, I can also dream of some incredible things. I have in my dreams heard my own piano concerto. I've seen my own videos. I've seen my own films. And I wake up and I'm going, I'm doing that today. Oh, so, so you, do you see them before I, they happen? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. And I have for years relied on something called creative visualization. And I've taught this to my students from the very beginning. I think this is absolutely critical. What That's, are you reaching for? Is that Shakti going? That is that that is my book. That that's, book. That's what a coincidence. Is my life. Wow. I you know I haven't read it yet, but I've I picked it up a couple of years ago, and it's yeah. one of those things that I've just been meaning to take a look at ever since. So when you when you mentioned that, I had to bring it up. That that's the book that taught me, and that book wow. has given me such power. Because it is all about manifesting internally and then bringing it out. And that's the part that takes courage. That's the part that takes skill. That's sure. the part. That's the hard part. The easy part is thinking it. You know, I, I want a Mercedes Benz. Okay, sure. But now how do I get that? Well, I need money. I need blah, blah, blah. And that's just a matter of doing it. It's no different. A little different with a relationship, with a symphony, with a, a beautiful sculpture, or with your next computer program. And solutions can come to you in that state. Creative isolation is a kind of meditation. I'm, I'm going to be on you about this book. You're not, you're not going to get rid of it I hope until so. I start hearing you talk about this. Uh, because that is an incredible book. And I, and I you know... I have always said that people come together for a reason. There's always some universal need for two people to come together. And that right there may be the secret read right there. Well, maybe that's the that, reason that we came together so that you could make that me read that book. My mind. That's amazing. And that's and right you know, there in your hand's reach. Right there. Right right on, on top of my desk. Goosebumps. Wait, you know, that is probably a great place to end the stream um but before we go do you have any final brief thoughts and where can everyone find you online well actually uh uh go to my instagram account that's where you're going to keep sort of on top of all my work that i do and doug i'd like you to go to your instagram account because i made for you a glitch portrait of you in celebration of this show Oh, so if wow. you head over to the to the Instagram universe, you'll see there waiting in your inbox a a, a JPEG that I made, uh, actually taken from this uh, green screenshot. Oh, that's awesome! So you you so made it right here. I I made it, and and you're welcome to to use it as you like. Make it an NFT. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that'll be my first one. So. Um, but yeah, uh, Instagram is a great place to look. I'm very, very active. Um, and and inst follow me, instant message me, whatever you'd like. Thanks. No problem. I did not mean to do that just now. <laughs> oh, I thought that was my, my subtle cue. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I'm still getting the hang of this. All right. So, well, I'm going to say goodbye, Paul. Thanks for coming out of the stream. Um, and I'll close with this. So are we living in the matrix? Is the universe just one big simulation? Is everything we think we know nothing more than a virtual reality? Ponder the answers to these questions and more next time on Glitch in the Matrix. Bye.